Sweden again. It's always a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I get in almost every q and A I I do in the United States, and yesterday in a q and A I I did in, in the Ukraine, in Ukraine, I get the same question over and over and over again. You know, everything you say sounds great, but doesn't Sweden stand in direct opposition, you know, proof that you're wrong. <laughs> Socialism works. Look at Sweden. So it's always good to be here to uh, collect anecdotes of why they are wrong. So please let me know afterwards. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, all right. So die after all. Um, so I'm always, uh, I'm always interested in picking up tidbits about, uh, about the counter argument to Sweden because you guys are the model for, 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 for the rest of the world. Everybody wants to be like you, except I guess some of you. <laughs> so, but that's. You know, we're working on that. So, you, and by the way, you can have Bernie Sanders anytime you want. I'm willing to quit. I'm willing to shoot. You can keep him. No, I don't, I don't want to. So, so one of the reasons Sweden is brought up a lot, and, and it's, it's such a big deal is made of it, is because this issue of inequality has become, over the last few years, a huge issue uh, in, in the West and certainly in the United States. So. Last year, there was a, a very well-known book by uh, Thomas Piketty, a uh, French economist that was published. I assume it was as big in Sweden as it was big as everywhere else, um, uh, called uh, Capital in the 21st Century. Um, it could have just been called Das Kapital and it would have been fine. Um, and, uh, you know, this was one of the best-reviewed books uh, in the last 20 years. I mean, everybody was falling over themselves in terms of positive reviews, at least initially, uh, for the book. And it, it, it had a huge impact, I think, on the debate, on the discussion in the United States and, and I think, and in, and in Europe. And since then, Piketty's written another book. It's come out in uh, this last summer. Now, what's interesting about Piketty's book is it was a bestseller immediately in the United States. Like, it sold off the charts. It went to number one on all the bestseller lists. But I don't know if you know this, but Amazon knows whether you read the books or not. It keeps track because on the Kindle, right, they can tell on, on the iPad, as long as you're using a Kindle app, they can tell whether you've read the book and how much of the book you've read. And they actually publish a statistic of the least read books of the year. <laughs> and the good news is Piketty's was number one. <laughs> so everybody bought it and nobody read it. Or at least nobody, it, people started it and couldn't get through. So, uh, so that's a good sign, I guess. Um, but everybody's declared this issue of inequality, rising inequality, uh, inequality getting so-called worse, Everybody's declared it as the issue of our time. Uh, or the Pope, uh, an important figure, uh, whether we like him or not, uh, he seems to be incredibly popular all over the world. Uh, he's declared it the most important issue we are facing. President Obama has declared it the most important issue we're facing. Uh, lots of economists and people I call former economists, like Paul Krugman, have declared this uh, you know, a, a, a crucially important issue. Uh, really the defining issue of the last 30 to 40 years. And this is the story that they tell, because they tell, and, and, and this the story relates to the United States, but I think you can relate it really to, to a lot of other countries, and this rising inequality is primarily an Anglo-Saxon phenomenon, although you're seeing it in, in other parts of Europe uh, as well, but it certainly is in, in Great Britain, it's in the United States, and it's Australia, and it's in a variety of different places. Uh, and the story is this. Uh, that, um, you know, nothing really happened in the world until uh, after the Great Depression when FDR put into the United States kind of all the, the beginnings of kind of social programs. And then suddenly a middle class was created, primarily after World War II. The, middle, the American middle class was created. So it's an interesting spin on history in terms of what happened in the 19th century. They kind of ignore the 19th century, right? That's child labor. You know, people were miserable and stuff was really bad. But after World War II, suddenly we had strong unions in the United States, and therefore we had a, a, a suddenly a rise in the middle class. What happened was income inequality was very large in the late 19th century. This is true in Sweden as well. In the early 20th century, inequality was very large. After World War II, inequality shrunk <coughs> dramatically, and it stayed low through the 1970s. And then because of Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, inequality has exploded since. 
And that's and that's historian. Of course, they paint the 50s and the 60s and the 70s in utopian colors. There's this wonderful time when the middle class was getting rich and everybody had opportunities in America and the poor were rising. And and it you know it's Ronald Reagan destroyed all that and uh, you know with a move towards so-called capitalism, deregulation, and lower taxes, and what we get is this is this dramatic expansion. Now we can talk a lot about the history and the perversion of just the data data that that involves. Right? They ignore the fact that the middle class was created during the 19th century. That before the 19th century there was wonderful equality. I mean. We were very, very equal in the 1800s, in the 1700s, and the 1600s, and you know, and all the way back to the caves. We were very equal. We were equally poor, equally dying at a very young ages. Equally, our kids didn't make it to age 10. Equally, life was how did Hobbes describe it? Short, brutish, and uh, nasty, nasty, brutish, and short. I always get the order wrong, but just remember, nasty, brutish, and short. And Hobbes was not making this up. In at that time, for most people, most people, I mean ninety plus percent of the population, life indeed was nasty and brutish and it was short. Life expectancy up until the nineteenth century was thirty nine. Thirty nine. Right? I'd be long dead and you guys would be middle aged. Right? Almost approaching the end of life. So there's this complete lack of appreciation for the fact that here's the nineteenth century and in the 19th century, yeah, inequality goes like that, right? But what happens? How does it get there? It goes like that, right? Everything goes up. Everybody gets richer. Everybody gets richer a lot. Life expectancy almost doubles, goes till about 59, right, from 39. It's adding 20 years of life in a century. That's amazing. <laughs> And by the way, why did income inequality uh, get reduced after World War II? What happened? Why do you have a convergence of, of wealth and income? Marshall. Well, the Marshall Plan, um, you know, helps kind of the bottom a little bit, redistribution of wealth from American taxpayers to Europeans. Um, but no, think about what happened during the war. Right? You had World War I. What happened in World War I and World War II? Lots of people died. Lots of people died, which is the real tragedy. But on top of that, if you think about wealth, what happened? Lots of stuff gets destroyed. Lots of stuff gets destroyed. Because not only do buildings get blown up and factories get demolished, and, but, but also there's a huge allocation of wealth from productive activity to building tanks and bombs, and which is not exactly productive, right? The only purpose of a bomb is to blow stuff up. It's not to build other stuff. So instead of building tractors, you're building tanks. Not a good trade, if, if what you're concerned about is wealth. So what you did is you destroyed massive amounts of wealth, massive amounts of capital. Who owns that capital? Well, relatively the wealthy do. So yeah, so what happened during World War II is everybody went down to begin with, right? And the wealthy went down a lot because they owned the buildings, they owned the factories, they were the ones who were now having all their capital shifted towards building tax. So yes, inequality shrunk because of the war. That's one method to do it. <laughs> and and if you think about Keynesian economics, Keynesians, you know, people like Paul Quigg would don't mind that because they believe that wars are good in the sense that they create economic activity. I mean, GDP grows during war. Anybody, you familiar with GDP? Why does GDP grow during war? Because GDP is a, is a the big factor in GDP is government spending. And government spend a lot during war. Right? So in the, in, in, during World War II, in the United States, GDP grew by 12%. The fact that lots of people were dying, the fact that the quality and standard of life of those living went down, partially because they were in trenches, but even if they were at home, quality of life went down. They were they were eating rations. They were you know everything was rich. so. GDP doesn't capture that because it's concerned just with the buying of the bombs and the so you know they really believe that in some senses wars are good for economic activity. Conflict is good for economic activity. You hear that a lot. Uh, indeed, a lot of times I hear the left saying things like. Uh, the reason America went to war was to spur its economy. I mean, really? 
I mean, maybe Republicans are that stupid, or maybe the people in power are that stupid that they think that will happen, but it's, it never actually, and it cannot actually happen. So they've got an interesting, they've got this economic story, uh, and, and the, the economic story is, is, is complete. I mean, in many ways, it's complete nonsense. Even this, part of the story of this expansion of, of inequality over the last 30 years which is probably true. We're probably seeing an expansion, but again, it's probably an expansion where everybody's rising, but some people are rising faster. Uh, so the problem they have, you know, so they have to make the argument that not everybody's rising, because otherwise people don't care. Right? Generally, Americans don't mind it if everybody's going like that. What they mind is if these people are stuck over here and this is going up. So the other story they tell is that Oh no, the, the 70s were this wonderful period and, and, and nobody is making any more money today than they did in the 70s. Uh, middle class is stuck in the 70s. Right? And a lot of people are buying this. This has kind of become now, uh, because they've got life's graphs and they've got, you know, they're very good with uh, econometrics, or very bad with econometrics. Uh, depends on how you view econometrics. But uh, they're very good at describing these numbers. But, uh, you know, I... I it's kind of obvious how silly the argument is if you actually look at human life rather than at the numbers. Right? So I, I don't know how many of you were around in the 70s. I mean, I, I fear that we're in a minority here. But I remember life in the 70s. Um, and it sucked. <laughs> Certainly in America, it sucked. Um, there was high inflation, there was stagflation, there was, there was high crime rates. Uh, but but really, what's important about the '70s is television was black and white, and big, you know, thick and really small screens. <laughs> no, but this is important. Think about what what we take for granted today. I, I have I shouldn't boast, but I have like an 80 inch television, <laughs> right? And it's thin, and it costs less than what those huge, massive, ridiculous things cost. And it's in color, or you know, some TVs in 3D or whatever. But that's an indication of just the quality of life. Americans live in much bigger homes today than they did in the 70s. They drive much better cars. Think about the technologies in the cars. I mean, the car hasn't changed that much, but it's, these are much better cars, much more efficient cars, much safer cars. I mean, we have iPhones. I mean, just that is worth a lot in terms of quality of life. So the quality of life of the middle class in America is a gazillion times better today than it was back then. A dollar today buys stuff that in the 70s we couldn't even imagine would exist 40 years later. So, I mean, at the end of the day, all I mean, I would argue that almost all the empirical arguments that Krugman and Piketty and these guys make are just wrong. And they, they, they misclassified and they missed. And a lot of people have already showed that the actual Piketty numbers have lots of problems in them. And that he picks and chooses his numbers. So, so let's put aside for a minute the, the empirical issue, right? Because I, I think it's wrong, and I think other people have shown in, in many different ways that it's wrong. Let's even assume that it's true. I like to do this in global warming, too. I don't think it's right, but let's assume that it's true. <laughs> I like to say Sweden becomes habitable. Cool. Uh, I usually use Canada. I mean, not, not, not just does Canada become habitable, but you actually can have agriculture in Canada, which, which would have incredibly fertile land, uh, which is not covered in ice. But, um, but let's assume even that, that the story about inequality that is expanding, that's really expanding, is that a problem? Should we care? Why do we care? And I think most Americans, at least, I know Europeans, this is not true. You guys have a culture which says that there's a problem with that. It feels bad. But why should we care? Why should we care? So the issue there is why do people make more money than other people? Why is inequality rising? Why is this gap being created? And if the explanation is that some people make a lot more because they're more productive, because they create better stuff, 
because they offer us better services. Because they've owned it. Then what's the problem? Isn't justice and fairness demand that people get what they can make in the marketplace? I mean, that would be my argument, obviously not the left. They've redefined justice and fairness for us. Justice and fairness mean what? When I say something's fair, automatic, what pops into your head? Equal. Fairness equals, fairness is equal. But that, that's never been the case. Fairness used to mean, before they switched it on us, used to, the left is very good at taking terms and switching their meanings. Fairness used to mean getting what you deserve. And economics, what do you deserve? How do you determine what you deserve in economics? What you create, what the marketplace will bear. How much value you create for other people, as it turns out. What they're willing to pay for the product you're willing to do. You know, Apple deserves a lot. Why? Because they've enhanced our life a lot. And how do we know they've enhanced our life a lot? Because we're willing to pay for it. If they weren't enhancing our life, we wouldn't pay. For it. We 400 bucks for this. Right? And just before I left the U.S., I went and got my, my new Apple TV and my new iPad. And, you know, because it's life enhancing. So it's cool. So they made a lot of money. But it's because our lives are better off. Otherwise, they don't make a lot of money. How much... If I pay 300 bucks for this, how much is it worth to me? More. 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 Than yes. There's a learning. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, usually I get equal, right? It's the same. And of course, you, would, you don't do the trade if it's equal. You, you're indifferent. You, you're going to stay home. But it's worth more than 300 bucks. And it turns out it's worth a lot more than 300 bucks to most people. They would actually pay a lot more than that. Because it's, it's, it's truly life-changing. So you're better off by buying the iPhone, and Apple makes a profit. So when you bought the iPhone, did any quality increase or not? Or when you buy, how many of you read Harry Potter? <laughs> when you bought a Harry Potter book for, I don't know, 20 bucks in America, did inequality change? Yeah, J.K. Rawlings became $20 richer, and if you aggregate all the $20, she became a billionaire. And you became $20 poorer. So when we measure inequality in terms of dollars, inequality just, you got poorer. You literally went down, and, and J.K. Rawlings went up. But is that true? Why not? Because you enhanced your life, but as an economist, I can't measure the enhancement. Now, I could, I could value the asset that is the book, but I don't think Piketty does that. I don't think he goes and he adds the books up and the iPhones and he counts those as, as assets. No. Literally, inequality just increased. You got poor by 20 bucks, according to them, and J.K. Rawlings got richer. And Apple gets richer every time you buy a product and you get poorer, supposedly. But that's how they measure it. That's how economists measure stuff. But it doesn't make any sense. Because it's life enhancing. Because our life is actually better for buying the stuff. And for get them getting rich. So when I see somebody really rich in a free market, assuming they've made it like Apple and like J.K. Rowling's made it, I go, thank you. Because the only way they could have become rich is made my life better. There's no other way to do it. Right? 300 years ago, people got rich by... Stealing other people's money. Today, again, assume freedom for a minute. People get rich by trading, by making our lives better. So, under a free market, who cares what inequality is? My life is better, your life is better, your life is better by more because you've helped lots of people. Who cares? How rich the rich become. And really, what you're concerned about, from an economic perspective, if you want to be concerned about anything, is that people seem to be, everybody keeps seems to be getting wealthier. But the, the weight, the relative weight at which people are getting wealthier, why would anybody care morally or economically? Economically, it's just a reflection of what's actually going on. And, and morally, if fairness means getting what you deserve, well, people are getting what they deserve. 
I'm a teacher. I don't deserve a lot. You're not paying much for this. Right? <laughs> if I charged 300 bucks, you wouldn't come. I mean, that's a market signal. <laughs> you would rather buy an iPhone. <laughs> right? Whether true or not, you would rather, you know, you believe that an iPhone will enhance your life more than coming to a lecture. And that, you know, I, I guess I'm okay with that because here I am. <laughs> so it's still a voluntary transaction, right? So that's what I'm worth from market perspective. That's the worth that you have. It's what the market will bear. That's fair. You know, for me to complain that you guys are not willing to pay 300 bucks is ridiculous. So, both from a moral perspective and from an economic perspective, in a free market, inequality is irrelevant. Now, you might ask in the world we live in today, which is not a free market, whether there are problems that inequality, that people talking about inequality might be, you know, uh, uh, there might be behind the inequality numbers, if you will. And, and I'd argue, yeah, sure. You could say that people are getting rich not because they're producing stuff that makes our lives better, but because they're in with the government and they're getting our tax money. So they're basically going back to the model 300 years ago of stealing the money, of robbing us, you know, being true robber barons. Cronyism, business in bed with government, that's a form of theft. So, yeah, that, that, that might be a problem. Indeed, it is a problem. Let's get rid of cronyism. Cool. That has nothing to do with inequality. It's got to do with an issue of cronyism. You could also argue that poor people seem in the United States and in many Western countries to be stuck. There doesn't seem to be as much mobility as maybe there used to be. There doesn't seem as much rising as there used to be. Now, it, again, there's a lot of questions about the empirics around this and whether they're true or not. But, you know, I, I, I see a lot of poor people in America who, who are just stuck in poverty. And I'd say that's a problem. Right? Not a problem of inequality, but why are they stuck? And, and I, think, I think it's pretty, you know, if you look at the data, it's pretty obvious why they're stuck. They're stuck because the state tells them that they are incompetent. How does the state tell them that? It sends them a check and tells them not to work. It sets a minimum wage so high that nobody is going to hire them because they can't produce at that level. They create licensing laws that make it impossible for somebody to get a simple job because they have to pay thousands of dollars to get a license. In California, you need a government license to shampoo hair. <laughs> and that's not unusual. Uh, to, to do nails, in many places you need a license. A government license. You have to take a course. You have to spend thousands of dollars to take a profession where you're not going to make thousands of dollars. And by the way, all of these policies are policies that are endorsed by whom? By the left, by the people who complain about inequality. Well, if you, to me, that is an indication that they don't care about the poor. So, there are problems in the world in which we live. There's no question. There are, problems, there are lots of problems in Sweden. There are lots of problems in America. None of those problems have to do with the relative wealth or the relative income of people. They have everything to do with problems with, the, with, you know, with keeping the poor poor, with rich getting rich, not justly, not fairly, not through production, but through connections, and with the middle class that might be stuck because the economy is not growing and the economy is not producing. All of these problems, problems, by the way, created by the left. Cronyism is a phenomenon of the left because as government grows, what does it do to business? It, it controls more and more of the life of businessmen, so businessmen are forced basically to lobby. Once they start lobbying, there's no stopping. That, that's, that's the process. I don't know how many of you have heard me tell the Microsoft story, but uh, in 1994, Microsoft executives were brought in front of the Senate in the United States. And uh, a, a Republican senator got up and yelled at them. You guys need to start lobbying. You don't spend any money in Washington. This isn't good. 
You have to understand you have to influence government. It's your, you know, in other words, bribe me. <laughs> You're not bribing me. Bribe me. Right? Otherwise, we're going to come after you. And you, uh, that thing said, you've got to build a building in Washington. You know, you're a Seattle company, you've got offices all over the country, you have nothing in Washington. Inside Washington, you need a building. Microsoft had nothing, right? Spent zero dollars on lobbying. No lobbying, no building, no presence in Washington, D.C. And the Microsoft executive basically said, look, we don't need you. If you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. All we're asking is, leave us alone. We don't want to come here, because right now you're leaving us alone. Fine. Guess what happened a year later? Right, actually, two years later, 96. Right, Justice Department went after Microsoft over antitrust. <coughs> and what was the what was the evil that Microsoft has done to justify that the government will go after it? They gave away what? I mean, antitrust, the monopoly power. Browsers with their operating system, right? They gave away a browser for free. And Netscape complained. Netscape was selling their browser. You guys don't remember a time <laughs> when browsers cost money. Just like any other software, you had to pay to get a browser. And Microsoft offered this for free. That was a sin that violated antitrust laws. I don't know how your antitrust laws work in uh, Sweden. I'm sure you have antitrust laws. But in the United States, they're written in such a way that every business in the United States is in violation of the antitrust laws all the time. Because think of it this way. If you offer a product for free, or what the regulators cons consider too cheap, what are you doing? Yeah, it's called dumping. You're, you're undercutting competition, you're destroying competition by dumping. So they go after the Japanese for dumping, and they go after all their people for dumping, you know. And they went after Microsoft, basically, under this theory, because they offered it for free. They were excluding competitors, right? Okay. So you're screwed if you offer too cheaply, right? What if you offer your, your product more expensive than the competition? That's proof you have a monopoly. <laughs> because how do you get away with it, right? The whole, the whole idea of perfect competition is it drives down prices. Right? Okay, so you offer your product for the same price as the competition. Well, then you're colluding. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, though. It's true. No matter what you do, and this is the beauty. This is the beauty of laws like this, right? Uh, how many of you have you been at the shrug? Most of you have been at the shrug. There's, there's a great scene where um, you know the government bureaucrat is coming in and talking to Riordan, and uh, and it, you know he's showing Riordan that he's violated the the law, and and Riordan, Riordan says to the regulator, "Look, the way it's written." No matter what I do, I'm in violation. And, and, and the, the regulator says, well, of course. I mean, do you think we want you to follow the laws? <laughs> the whole point of these regulations is for you to break them, and that's how we have leverage over you. That's how we can control you. So the whole idea of these things is to force you to break them so they can impose their will on you. Anyway, so cronyism is a phenomena of big government of government intervention in the economy. Uh, people stuck in poverty is a phenomenon of big government, of all the regulations that limit labor, limit creation of jobs and that keep wages down or keep people unemployed because wages are artificially set too high. And the stagnation of the limited class is, is, to the extent that it even exists, is again a phenomenon of lack of economic growth, which is a consequence of high taxes and but primarily of, of uh, the government regulations. So, if all these are leftist policies, what's the left really after? And, and here I'm talking about, I'm talking about not the, the, the average voter who's voting for the left. I'm talking about the intellectuals. I'm talking about the leaders. I'm talking about the Park Krugmans and the Stiglitzes and the Obamas and the, the Bernie Sanders and, and so on. I, I'm sure you have lots of the equivalents here to <laughs> Because, you know, take the minimum wage. This is economics 101. The higher you raise the minimum wage, the more you create unemployment. Right? This is just, if you, any price you take, you artificially raise it, demand for that product goes down. So if you raise the cost of labor, demand for labor, that kind of labor goes down. It's just the way it works. 
So what you do is you create unemployment among people who don't produce at that level, and, and companies convert to machines or convert to something else that is now more effective because you've, I mean, McDonald's in, in the United States, because a lot of cities are raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour, uh, that you're, you're going to go into McDonald's and order on an iPad. I think there's some countries in Europe where you already do this. You order, you order it off of a kiosk. And it, there are a number of chains that are experimenting with, machi with uh, machines that will flip the hamburgers, right? That will take the hamburger, put, put the pickles on it, put the buns, and deliver them automated without anybody touching them. Now, that would probably happen anyway, but what's accelerating it is, is the higher cost of labor. Now, everybody knows this, including the leftist economy. So what is really, what really motivates Piketty and all the, all, all the, the whole debate? Now, in my view, and this is kind of controversial, not that anything else is. <laughs> um, no, but this one, people find it hard to believe. They don't, I don't think, I mean, I think this is true of, of, of leftist intellectuals generally. I don't think they care one bit about the poor. I just don't think they care. You know, they kind of care about the middle class because they are typically middle class. But what really motivates, what really gets them going, is hatred for the rich. They hate ability. They hate success. They hate wealth. They hate the people at the top. In pretty much anything. And they're committed to this. This is, this is they're philosophically committed to this notion of, of equality. But they know what equality means. right? What does equality mean? How do we get equality? Everyone's poor. Yeah, but everyone's poor, but how do we get to that situation? right? So, so I use this example. right? Everybody know who LeBron James is? LeBron James in basketball. How do you make me and LeBron James equal? In basketball. Yeah, you have to cut it, you have to break his legs. Uh, cutting is a little dramatic. <laughs> you have to break his legs, right? And and you know you haven't seen me play basketball, but you might have to break an arm as well. <laughs> you can ban basketball. What's that? You can ban basketball. You can ban basketball. That's what, that's another way to do it. That's true. But then we're not. E I I want. I demand. I have a right. To be able to go on the court with LeBron James and feel like he's equal. Oh, I demand it. Right? So we break his legs and we break it up. And my point is this. That's always what equality demands. That's always what equality demands. Taking 50-60% of your income is like breaking legs. I don't know. I work hard for my money. I'm sure those of you who work do as well. Taking 50% of my money is 50% of my time, 50% of my life. I mean, I sometimes think, what would I rather have? Somebody come in and break my legs once a year or take 50% of my income once a year? I'm not sure what I do. I make a good amount of money and 50% is a lot of money. I could do a lot with it. Maybe even, you know, fix my legs. <laughs> but, but it's violence against you. Is my point. It's the same thing. Somebody is coming and using violence to make 50% of what you make. Just like they're using violence to make your legs. And this is what equality always demands. This is what equality always leads to. The whole campaign for equality is a campaign of force. It's a campaign of violence. And I think that's how we, those of us who are against it, need to hold it. Because we need to be outraged by it. It's not a game. It's not nice. There's nothing nice about equality. Equality, in my view, equality, the idea of equality of outcome, is the most evil idea I can think of. Because it demands, you know, the Australians have this saying, you have to chop down the tall poppies. Like the poppies grow differently. You have to chop down the tall poppies. It demands breaking people's legs. And when you can't literally break their legs because some people are smarter than other people, what do you do then? That's a real problem, because we're not equal in smarts, and they want equality. And it's not just equality of wealth or equality of opportunity, as they like to say. It's equality. You know, and it, there's one regime in history that actually tried to do this, create this equality, I mean, really equality, 
you know, where they thought the communists didn't get didn't get it right and they wanted to do it right. They all studied in Paris. They all the all the all the members of this regime, the leaders, they studied the you know, Sartre and Camus and and Foucault and all all the all the great French French philosophers of equality, right? And then they went home, and they took over the government, and they wanted to. They decided they were going to establish equality. But you, what's that? You're talking about Cambodia. Yeah, but you, you can't give it away. <laughs> You know, so so some people were living in the cities, and some people were living in the countryside. So what did they do? They emptied the cities. They pushed everybody out into the countryside. But even in the countryside, some people were good at foraging, picking berries and nuts, and some people were not. So they banned foraging. That's like banning basketball, right? But still, some people could read, and some people couldn't. Some people were smart, some people weren't. Some people were good farmers, some people were not. What do you do? if you believe in equality, then you get rid of the people who stand a little taller. Basically, they're shot. They killed them. If you had an education, they shot you. If you could read, they shot you. If you wore glasses, they took that as a sign of intelligence, they shot you. They killed two million people out of a population of five and a half. Six. So they killed a third of their own population, their own people. You, know, you can go to Cambodia, you can see the killing fields. The horrific nature of what these people did. All in the name of what? Of French philosophers' vision of equality. This is what equality actually means. We're not equal. Metaphysically, in reality, we are all different. And that's great. It makes life interesting. I mean, isn't it cool that there's a, there was a Steve Jobs there? Who could make the stuff? I could have never imagined an iPhone. Isn't it cool that there are people who love building automobiles and people who love doing painting paintings? I mean, who has the talents of a Michelangelo? We don't. We should celebrate the geniuses who make our lives so much better. We should celebrate the, 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 the incredible people that really raise us out up both materially and spiritually. They're the people who, who should be our heroes. The great industrialists, the great artists, the greats. What a great fill-in-the-blank, the great basketball players. It's cool. Now, for some reason, we, we accept it with basketball, right? With sports, we somehow accept that, that, that it's okay, but nowhere else. So, we should be for inequality. Passionately for inequality. It's a beautiful thing. It's fairness. It's justice. And the people we should be celebrating are not the, uh, not the people in the middle, but the people at the top, assuming they gained the top for good reason. The great writers, the great artists, the great industrialists, the great computer programmers, I don't know, whatever. That's what moves civilization. That's what makes our life. So, um, Quality sucks. Inequality is great. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I thought I would. Sorry. Questions? Um, first of all, thank you very much. And uh, I would like to say that the history that you described at the beginning of your speech is more or less the same history as we are told this week. Before the Social Democrats there were poverty, then everyone became rich. Uh, basically. My question is that during the latest maybe two years or so, I've been noticing um, this kind of social justice warrior movement in the United States, yeah. in uh, different universities in the United States, rising and becoming very, very vocal. And we've also been uh, importing a lot of that into, uh, into Sweden. Would you comment on that? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mean, social justice movement is is a movement for equality of outcome. That's, and, and they have expanded equality to beyond income and beyond wealth to, you know, how we treat each other at, at, every, at every level. They, you know, schooling has to be completely equal. Um, but, of course, in a, in, a, in a perverted sense, right, so... Um, 
you can't say things like, they don't allow you to say things like in America today. I can't say, I'm colorblind. I don't care what the color of your skin is, I treat you the same. They consider that offensive. Because I'm not taking into account the sensitivity that's involved in past discrimination. You know, they, they, they've got a long story about these things. Right? So, because this standard is this is this platonic form of equality, they, they of course, encourage people to be treated differently to compensate for past inequality. So, it gets very complicated and convoluted. Um, but it's, it's driven by uh, the intellectuals, it's driven by university professors and writers and thinkers, it's driven, it really comes from, that, from kind of the, the intellectual elites in America. Uh, it's driven by emotion, it's a, it's a movement that's, you know, generally in America today, one of the things I think that are most worrisome among young people is that we have elevated emotions to the most important thing in life. Everything's about emotions now. Um, so it's how you feel. It's not what you think, it's how you feel. So what they want is equality of feeling. There's no end to that. Um, but this is, I don't know if you know this, but in, in a, in a, at the University of California today, if you're a professor and you give people a, a reading assignment, right? And, and let's say in the reading assignment somebody dies of cancer, make it sort of kind, of, kind of neutral. You actually have to let the students know in advance that somebody is going to die of cancer, and this might trigger them. Triggering means they might get a negative emotion because maybe they had a relative who died of cancer. And then universities are setting up safe zones where, 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 where students can go and play with dolls or play, I don't know what, but they can, they can be protected from reality in some way. It, 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 people talk about microaggressions, you know, little things you might say that people would find insulting. And, and, you know, that's, you can't do, in other words, you can't talk, you can't teach, you can't, there's no controversy, controversy is not allowed. This is a huge attack on free speech, but of course they can't attack free speech in America because we have First Amendment, so this is kind of an attack from the bottom rather from, from a legal attack. Um, and it's all after this idea of, of kind of emotional, everybody has to be emotionally okay, emotionally stable. And it's the primacy of emotion over anything else. The death of reason, the death of rationality. And yeah, I think America is exporting this to Europe. But, but you guys deserve it because we got, we, got, we got German romanticism from you. So <laughs> we're sending it back. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Yes, inequality, the opposite of good <clears throat> or an, just an acceptable outcome of a fair system. It's the only outcome of the fair system. Yes, but uh, with, would you say it's just an outcome, or would you say it's a good outcome? I'd say both. I'd say it's a just and a good outcome. Assuming it's, it's under freedom. Yeah. So my view is uh, that freedom is just, freedom is good, and any outcome that is an outcome that freedom generates is a just and good outcome. Um, now, does that mean that, uh, you know, stuff happens to people that, uh, that you would say is unfortunate. Sure, people have accidents. Good people get run over in the streets or whatever, right? People, people fall on, you know, bad luck happens. But that's, see, luck is not an issue of fairness or justice. Luck is just luck. It's just reality, right? So you don't say... It's unjust that the tornado wiped that village out. You say it's sad. You say it's unfortunate. But it's not an issue of justice. Why? What does justice refer to? And this goes to the social justice issue. What does justice refer to? Well, it's more than wealth, because I, I, you know, there are lots of things that can be unjust or just. But, but, but what, what does it refer to? Who is just? Who can be just? Humanity. Humanity. Yeah, the man-made. So individuals. And this is why another reason I hate social justice, because there is no such thing. Individuals are just or unjust. Individual choices are just or unjust. Individual actions are just or unjust. And you can talk about a just society as an abstraction. 
But there's no social justice. There's individual justice. We as individuals are either justice or unjust. Nature, there's no justice as applied to nature. Now this is an important philosophical point because are you guys familiar with John Rawls? Yeah. Well, he's, he's our contribution. He's our retribution to you guys for getting all these <laughs> bad European philosophers. Um, so here's a good, bad American philosopher. Rawls says, look, we're all born with, um, with different genes. Some of us are going to be very successful. Some of us are going to do very badly because of our genes. And it's not just our genes, he says. Some of us are born into good families, and some of us are born into bad families. And he says, that's not fair. That's not just. Now, that's a philosophical perversion. You can't apply fairness and justice to the metaphysical. Yes, it's true. Some of us are born with good genes, and some of us are born with lousy genes. You can say that's fortunate and unfortunate. You can say... You can even talk about luck if you want. Some of us have good parents or bad parents. What the parents, bad parents do to their children might be unjust. But the fact of being born into that condition is not just unjust. It just is. It's just reality. Some of us like the Bond James are born tall and very athletic. That's not an issue. It's not unjust that I wasn't born tall and athletic. It just is. That's reality. So you can't apply the terms of fairness and justice to what's metaphysical. What just and unjust relates to is human behavior, is individual behavior. But that generates huge confusion. So somebody like Warren Buffett says, you know, Warren Buffett is the second richest man in America. Uh, so Warren Buffett says, I don't deserve any of this wealth. Basically, like Obama said, I didn't build it. Yeah, you didn't build it. Warren Buffett says, I didn't build it. He says, look, I was born with great genes that gave me a particular talent that was useful in the 20th century. Not useful in the 15th century, but in the 20th century. So I was lucky to be born in the 20th century with the right genes to the right parents. That's why I made all my money. So, what's wrong with that? What's he, what's he leaving out? Yeah, choice. The big, the big debate in psychology is nature, nurture. Yeah, right. It's all about nature. And, and, and the revolutionary thinking is, no, no, it's both. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm saying, no, no, there's a third component you're missing. Yeah, nature and nurture make a difference. But what's the third component? Choice. choice, free will. The choices you make, the decisions you make, shape you much more than your genes or your parents do. It's the choices you make. So yeah, he was born with the right genes to the right parents at the right time. Other people probably were. He made something of it. Other people didn't. Okay. So, but the fact that he was born in that those circumstances don't make anything he made unjust or unearned. That's just a starting point. That's just a given. That's metaphysical. That's nature. And morality doesn't apply to nature. It only applies to our behavior. Uh, okay, it, it's more a comment than a simple question, but uh, you said uh, we asked what the left, uh, what uh, the rationale for the left was, and if it only would have been hatred of the rich, I could say it would have been okay, uh, not okay, but yeah. uh, uh, but uh, think of uh, it like this instead that. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, if you uh, have a model of equality, then uh, you kind of both take out the individual choice and everything, and then you you're getting closer to the uh, deciding the hegemonial outcome, and uh, then you can control. Uh, you have full control over yeah, so I was trying to be nice to the left. <laughs> yeah, but uh, what, right. uh, if, uh, the question is, uh, if that's the rationale for the left, what is your comment then that, uh, the uh, uh, what do you say, 
in relation to uh, to freedom because it's you can't you can't only tackle that with equal is unfair. It's also uh, it attacks the open society or our freedom. What attacks open society? Uh, if the strife for equality. Oh, the strife for equality. Yeah. Yes. So uh, yeah, that's a good point. I'll, I'll make it and we make it in the book. But let me just say about this hatred of the rich. <clears throat> It's more than hatred of the rich, much more than hatred of the rich, just even in terms of hatred. What it ultimately is, is hatred of, of life, it's hatred of progress, it's hatred of human beings. Because what does equality lead to? It, breaking legs. And it turns out not just of the rich, but of the smart, of the tall, of the talented. It's, it's, we know what happens when you equate, you get the lowest common denominator. So they want everybody to be poor. And they know that's a consequence because it's been tried a thousand times and it's always that result. And yet they rationalize it because nobody can live with that kind of hatred. So you create theories to explain that it's not the case. But what's really driving is, is in a sense a hatred of life. I think you're making up a, a, a different point. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to answer what I think you're asking, but I'm not sure I've got it. Um, So part of what they, they're going after is no freedom and control over people. Because that's, and part of what motivates them is, is this desire for power. It's, it's a desire to be the philosopher king who gets to decide how we all live our lives, our miserable lives. You know, and they get, they get, to, they get to make the choices. So that's power over us. Uh, freedom is, in a sense, the exact opposite. It says nobody should have power over you as a human being. You get to make the choices for your own life. And everybody gets to make the choices for their own life. And in that sense, I am for equality. This is the only sense I'm for equality. So there isn't one sense in which equality actually means something. I don't think equality of outcome or any of these other equalities mean anything other than destruction. But there's one sense in which equality means something. And it's a sense in which the founding fathers in America... Talked about all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. And it's the, it's, it's the sense of political equality. That is, we're all equally free. We all equally have a right to our own lives. We all equally have a right to make decisions for ourselves. We all equally have a right to be, to liberty, to pursue our happiness. Nobody Nobody should be cursed. Nobody should be forced. Not that just tall people shouldn't be forced, or just uh, aristocrats shouldn't be forced, or just white people shouldn't be forced. Nobody, no human being should be forced. Force should be extracted from the equation, leaving us all free. So the argument for freedom is that my life is mine, belongs to me, to make whatever I want out of it. Poor, rich, middle class, doesn't matter. The outcome is not the issue. It's an issue of freedom. It's an issue of autonomy. It's an issue of where the starting point is. The starting point for the left is always the group. And therefore, they're worried about relative. The starting point for somebody who believes in freedom is always the individual. And the question is never, how am I doing relative to other people? Who cares? The question should always be, how am I doing relative to me? Relative to my capacities. Relative to my abilities. Relative to my my values relative to my ambitions. That's the question. So individualism doesn't lead to envy. Collectivism always does, because collectivism is all about the group. How am I relative to everybody else? Suddenly it's a positioning. So freedom, real freedom, freedom from coercion, allows individuals to thrive, and of course, once we thrive, we thrive in different ways and, and in different capabilities. But at the end of the day, it's all about individual freedom. Right, so I think, in, uh, if we talk about the sort of average voter, I think you know, most people have this passively, of course, this sort of utilitarian perspective where they say that uh, <coughs> it's, it's good if we take wealth from the better off and distribute it to the less well off people who makes more benefit. So, but how, do you, know, how would you? Just but how do we even know that? Maybe the pain that you're causing the rich is greater than the benefit you're giving the poor. Yes, how I do we even that. measure that? I mean, I love utilitarian but, argument. But if you are talking to the sort of the and you want to try to convince them that he's in fact better off with inequality, yeah. you could either, I guess, uh, try to prove things that freedom is more important yes. than, than this benefit to others. But I think more possibly you would like to argue that it does in fact. Benefit 
benefit of people and what gives them more benefit and quality of life. But how, how would you do that if you talk to people? Yeah, so I would I would make I would make two arguments and I think you have to make them both. First of all, I would make the argument that freedom benefits him more. Because I, I truly believe that getting a check from somebody else without earning it is actually harmful to you. It harms your self-esteem, it harms your pride, and it makes it impossible for you to be happy long time. It's really important that people have a sense that they are earning what they have. And it's not just, it's not just given to them, right? theft from other people, which is what redistribution is. So, in my view, welfare, in the American model or the Swedish model, institutionalizes certain people into poverty and into unhappiness. So it's not just poverty, it's unhappiness. So yes, they're relatively they're less poor they, because they have more money, but what they've lost is much more important than what they've gained. And I think that's an argument we have to make to poor people. Is, is what you've lost is pride, what you've lost is self-esteem, what you've lost is the capacity to rise up. You're incentivized now to stay where you are and you can't rise up. But of course, you can make the economic argument, which, you know, you could, I won't, I don't think it's a utilitarian argument, but you can make an economic argument. That, I mean, it, it's really simple. That if, if the rich keep their money, what do they do with it? You know, one of the, one of the, uh, uh, new theories that are coming out. It's so stupid, it's hard to even call it a theory. <laughs> no, but it's, it, it is. It's, it's, it's the idea that the problem with the rich having a lot of money, this is coming out of, uh, I, mean, I don't know if Piketty's actually said this, but, but uh, Krugman has hinted at this. The problem with the rich having a lot of money, from an economic perspective, <coughs> is that they consume so little. <laughs> they consume so little. So they're sitting on this massive amount of money that's not being consumed. It's Scrooge McDuck. And we know that consumption drives the economy. So what we need to do is if we take that money from them and give it to poor people who have a high propensity to consume, then that money will be better for the economy. Now that is economic garbage. <laughs> because what happens to that money that the rich are so-called hoarding? It's invested. And every economic theory, by the way, including <coughs> Keynes, Keynes never said this, including Keynes, says that long-term economic growth is dependent on investment, which comes from saving. And what you want, and this is, you know, why is China grown so fast, Japan grew so fast? It's because they saved a lot. And part of the problem in the United States is we don't save. Now, we've done well because the Chinese have saved a lot, so they've invested in the U.S. But at some point... You know, that doesn't work. You have to save. Otherwise, there's no long-term growth from a purely economic perspective. So when the rich can make a lot of money, they invest that money, which creates more wealth for them, but it also, by investing, it creates jobs, it creates new products, and again, every time I buy one of these, I'm actually richer, even though financially I'm poorer. I'm actually richer. So the poor, the middle class, are enormously enriched core life by the fact that the rich, assuming the rich are the productive rich, right, are building, are creating, are producing stuff that we all consume. But that's, you see, the problem with that is nobody's ever convinced by economic arguments. I do. I mean, not in all people, but most people. Because if, if they were convinced by economic arguments, we would be living in love if they haven't today. I mean, we've had... I mean, people have really been good at explaining this stuff, whether it's Hayek or Mises or Friedman. Milton Friedman was very good at explaining simple, you know, all of these so-called complex economics in very simple terms that people can understand, and nobody believed them. <laughs> I mean, except the people in the room. You're a minority in Sweden, right? And I'm, I'm a <laughs> tiny minority in the United States. Because people are, I, people are driven by what they believe is fair, what they believe is just. So I believe people are driven by morality, not by economics. So they're willing to accept voodoo economics, made-up economics, completely bogus economics, if it justifies their moral beliefs. 
So the reason, therefore, redistribution of wealth is not for economic argument. It's purely because they believe it's fair and it's just and it's, 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 it's good. Even if you could prove to them that it lowered economic growth, they would still take the fairness argument. They would still take it, you know, for, for most people. Uh, people, are, people want to be good. They want to be just. They want to be moral. They're willing to give up a lot of wealth in order to do that. It's why rich Americans vote to raise their taxes all the time on themselves. Because they think it's the right thing to do. They, and, and they're willing to be poor and do the right thing. And I think most people are like this. And so we need to make the moral argument. We need to make the moral argument that inequality is fair. And equality is unfair. Equality is, is, is indeed an evil idea. Are you familiar with a Canadian named uh, Stefan Molyneux? Yes. Yeah, because I think it, uh, he put it uh, quite well uh, in terms of inequality uh, when he said that uh, most people like free market uh, when they can exempt themselves from it, which means that I can buy the best TV or whatever at the lowest price, which infers uh, competition, but me, myself, I want uh, the minimum wage and stuff because they cannot perform themselves. But they would like the free market in every other aspect of their life, but not when they uh, themselves have, have to come. I mean, I think there's an element of truth to that. But again, I don't think it goes deep enough I, because I, I, I don't think it goes to the core of it, which is, which is the moral views about the world. You know, so, so yes, they want all the good free stuff. But why? Why do they want uh, good free stuff? I don't want good free stuff. I want to own my stuff. I don't, I don't, I don't want just handouts. I want to, I, I love working. You know, I love producing. It's fun. It's cool. I mean, hopefully all of you will have jobs that you love. I mean, so there, there's something about it that, 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 that there are assumptions very early in life, unfortunately, so it's hard to change about the world, about work, about stuff, about where stuff comes from. You know, they think it's like manna from heaven. Right? It's a damage the Bible has done. Right? <laughs> but there's an idea that manna can drop from heaven, right? There's the, you know, there's this Jews wandering around the Sinai Desert and, you know, God drops manna. Where does that come from? <laughs> and they eat, right? So they don't have to farm. So they don't have to, they don't have to do anything. They just get it. Now, now that's a welfare state. But it's not, right? Somebody has to be sacrificed. And, and, and we need to talk in those things. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about uh, the future society where uh, there would be almost no human production because of advanced AI? How do you think about like the quality of that future society, which I believe is, is quite new? Yeah, so I, let, me, let me start by saying that I hope we get there, because if the status continue on the path that they're going, you know, the, the advance in technology might not get us there. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I think that's part of the beauty of markets. So I believe that there, we will look, we'll probably work less. Uh, work will probably be more fun. Um, a lot of the work we will do, we can't even imagine today what it will be. Uh, because uh, what what is what has mechanization done for human beings? It's basically taken away all the dull, boring work, right? So ninety percent of human beings once needed a farm in order to produce enough food for us to live. Now, only one percent of us farm. Farming's not fun. It's it's hard. It's physical labor. It's many hours. It's not. So a small percentage of people might enjoy that. They get to do it. The rest of us don't have to farm, right? Uh, you remember, anybody see uh, Charlie Chaplin's uh, Modern Times? Yeah. Right? The assembly line. All he does is screw it this way for 12 hours, right? You don't do that anymore. Now a, a robot does it, right? Slowly, all the manual labor will disappear. All the, all the dull stuff will go, even... Even the dull programming stuff will go away. And then the question is, can we as human beings, uh, is the boundaries endless in terms of what we can invent that's going to be more interesting and more fun? And, and, and I believe the answer is yes. I mean, so far, so good, right? We keep, we keep finding more stuff to do. Uh, think about it. Before mechanization, 
I, I think in, in, in like 1800, there were less than a billion people on the planet. I think it was half a billion. Today, there are seven going to eight billion people on the planet. Uh, we're living much longer. And uh, everybody has a job. I mean, assuming a little bit of freedom, everybody has a job. So w there's plenty of work to do, right? Even though machines are doing a lot of work already. So I, I believe there'll always be work to do. I, I don't know what that work will be. I mean, for example, there are, and, and these are things that people don't even think about, right? There are whole professions that didn't exist 100 years ago. I mean, oh, they existed, but they were tiny. Like, like um, I mean, stuff that I like, right? Chefs. Restaurants didn't exist 100 years ago. There were a few taverns for travelers when they were going through, but nobody went out to eat. About 100 years ago, maybe. Certainly not 200 years ago. Because there was no wealth. There was no excess. You ate what you grew. Hotels. There was no hotel business. There were no masseuses. Talk about manual <coughs> labor, right? Massage didn't exist. I mean, maybe people did it to family members. There was no profession. So, I mean, think of all the leisure stuff that we do. There was no leisure. So, that's a whole category of jobs that millions, probably tens of millions of people around the world engaged in. that didn't exist 200 years ago. And even 100 years ago, were very small. Who knows where that goes, you know, 200 years from now. But basically all of entertainment. All of entertainment. All right. Who, who, yeah. There were few people, like there was a Mozart... And who had a who had a very small audience at the court, and uh, there was one Michael, but there was no popular art. I mean, people sang in the villages, but nobody paid you to sing in the village. Or, or, or nothing. Now today, think about. I mean, both my kids, who are about your age, both my children are in the entertainment business. One is in music, and one writes comedy, right? And they're entertainers. That only can happen in a rich society, that only can happen in a society that's being automated, where we have so much excess that we can sit around watching YouTube videos of cats. Of, <laughs> I mean, think about it. Of, of, of comedians or whatever. So there's an there's a industry, a whole industry called comedy. Well, think about the qu quantity of music you could consume today. Um, so... Uh, you know, to come, I, I, sometimes I think about this stuff because there's a lot being written these days about singularity and what happens to computers are smarter than human beings. I don't buy this computers will be conscious stuff. I, I think there's, some, there's a piece missing there. But, but 200 years ago, you know, the computer will be inside here. They're, we'll be implanting the chips inside our brains. I mean, we'll be part computer, part human. I'm not sure there'll be a separation between the two. And, but but who can imagine what we could do? I mean, that's why science fiction writers get paid so much money. Because they can imagine the stuff. I, I can't. I have a poor imagination. But I'm not worried. If anything, I wish I could live 200 years to see it. Because I think it would be fun. I, I, what worries me is that we won't get there because because of status. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's very much in use right now in Sweden is that we have a... Or in Europe, we have a huge refugee crisis. What is your view on uh, on the um, <clears throat> policy prospects uh, for an unequal society uh, that is free? How should we react to this crisis? How should we handle the uh, immigrants? So that two, the, 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 I mean, it, there's a number of issues here that have to be untangled, right? Why are all the refugees want to go to two countries? Sweden and Germany. I mean, every single one I've seen interviewed on television. How do we get to Germany and then to Sweden? I mean, that's the path. Why? Because when they arrive here, you give them a check. Hey, I might immigrate. <laughs> and then you give them a home. Even though there's a, from what I understand, there's a housing shortage in Sweden. For you young Swedes, but they get a home. So you created a perverse incentive in welfare state Europe that anybody can get a check. I mean, that's absurd. So the welfare state needs to go. Right? So in a free world, you wouldn't have a welfare state. So the magnet, at least that particular magnet, wouldn't exist. Instead of people coming here because they want to work, because they want to produce, because they want to be part of a society, they're coming here in order to leech off of you, which is wrong. 
So that's one aspect of it, right? It's the, the existence of a welfare state. But there's a second complexity, and this is politically incorrect to say, but you know, I'm not politically correct. Um, and that is that I believe the West is at war. I believe there's a war going on, a civilizational war, if you will, between the West and between radical Islam. And it, we haven't declared this war, but if there's a war going on that we refuse to acknowledge because we've stuck our head deep in the sand, then if there is a war, you can't just let the enemy, because most of the immigrants are Muslim. Now, I don't know what percentage of them are radical Muslims, but nobody knows because nobody, nobody cares, right? Uh, you can't just let the enemy into your territory. You know, America didn't allow Nazis into America during World War II. So we are the one that's selling most weapons in the Middle East, the Swedish people, the Swedish government. Yeah, I'm not saying why the war exists. We can talk about why the war exists and who's at fault. But the point is that if there is a war, yeah. you don't allow the enemy in. So you have to decide if there's a war or not. I believe there is one, and, and that, should be a, that should be a reason to have a barrier. And then you have to do something about the welfare state. It's, it's, it's not just, it's not fair, it's not right that people can just show up at your door and receive goodies. That comes at somebody's expense, and, and why take from them in order to give? So, you know, in a free society that's not at war, then I believe in open migration. The people should be able to move and, and you know, I'm an immigrant. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I did this, my, my kids, I mean, I come from a long line of wandering Jews, right? So my kids are fourth generation born on a different continent, different continent, right? So uh, I, uh, they were born in the U.S., I was born in Israel, my parents were born in South Africa, their parents were born in Lithuania. My wife's mother was born in Morocco. Her father was born in what was then Palestine, and her father's grandparents were born in Uzbekistan. So, yeah, we cross borders. We move. Cool. So I'm all for migration. But it shouldn't be at people's expense. Nobody paid me to go to America. Nobody gave me a check. Right? Nobody paid my ancestors to go to, to my grandparents to go to South Africa. When they left Lithuania, they were kind of running because they, you know, they were being killed. But you know, so they had a strong incentive to leave, just like these migrants have a strong incentive to leave now. I mean, they're being killed. It's horrible what's going on in Syria and the rest of the Middle East, oh, in the rest of Africa. But yeah, and that war started because of the United States, yeah. No. Why? Why did it went to war to with Iraq? Well, let's put Iraq aside a second. But the war in Syria is not about Iraq. But that was uh, from the war in Syria started before ISIS. It was there it started. It was there it started. Yeah. But look, I mean, let's get Syria right. We had uh, we had uh, Bashar al-Assad, a brutal dictator. Your was, opinion? No, not in my opinion. It was opinion. In fact, okay. there's such a thing as reality, and there's such a thing as fact. He's a dictator. Was he elected? No. Were you, did you have free speech in Syria? No. If you, uh, if, if you did something that he didn't like, did you go to jail and were you tortured? Yes. I mean, he's a dictator. I mean, th that's not an issue of opinion. Now, some people benefited from the dictator, like with all dictators. Some people benefit and other people don't benefit. But the uprising against Assad is the same uprising that started in the late 1970s, early 1980s, of the Muslim Brotherhood against his father. And what does his father do when the, when the uprising happened back then? He flattened homes. He killed 20,000 to 40,000 people. Bashar Assad's father. So Assad inherited the same kind of regime. The same kind of, and, and again, he had an uprising. An uprising led to the current civil war, which was complicated and extended by the fact that the United States made a disaster out of Iraq, which then create, helped create ISIS and the whole mess that we have today is a consequence of that. But, okay, well, whoever's fault it is, that's the reality in the Middle East. And, and the fault at the end of the day is not Americans. The fault is, the fault is, uh, is, uh, is a brutal dictator. The American Pro went to war with Iraq. Sorry for interrupting. Sure. I'm sorry. I don't want to really get into the Middle no, East okay, yet. But look, but look, 
uh, 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 Iraq was ruled by another dictator. The fault for the problems in the Middle East are the people in the Middle East. They're ruled by dictators. That doesn't end well, ever. Whether America invaded Iraq or didn't invade Iraq, Iraq was a mess. Shiites were being killed <coughs> by a Sunni president who was gassing his own people. That's, that's not because of America. No, but, I mean, maybe civilian X would have died under one regime, but then as a result of an invasion, some other civilians died. Sure, no, I, 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 I mean, I don't want to get... the end result is the same, even if you have a moral background to it that is different, right? I don't know. I don't know if it's mentally it's the same. The, the the point is, and and the question is, is the invasion just or unjust? But that's a whole other question. But the problems in the Middle East were not created by the West. The problems in the Middle East are created by people in the Middle East. Talking about Bashar al-Assad, there they have a, a very a big song going on, uh, singing about him that it goes, "Ala Surya Basar Ubas." Have you heard it before? No. No. My point is that it's very, very, uh, in my opinion, yeah. talking about the conflict, yeah. it gets uh, hard to take an angle. In a specific case, talking about the Middle East. I it's relatively talk. easy. No. If you know the history, I don't think it's that hard. Yeah, the government made, uh, the government made a... 9/11 that the uh, Americans did, and well, then Americans they blamed the Queen. Okay, but look, let's my okay. Oh, you, you, you tell, let me tell my point of view. Yeah, I, okay, okay. Well, I, well, I it's my stage. I, I listened to you for like two hours. I didn't say, say it. Okay, then it's your stage. You should, you should speak. Okay, uh, excuse me, I think we have yeah. one last question. Yeah. Uh, okay, another spin on uh, the, uh, the refugee. On the no, what? On the refugees. Another spin. On refugees. Okay. No, but this is. Uh, this, uh, what do you say, uh, strive in the West for uh, equality, uh, equality yeah. and the focus on it. Yeah. But, uh, do you think that has impacted much on how, uh, how we view the refugees or the ones we, uh, we yes. accept to our borders? I mean, we, we basically, in both Sweden, Germany, and all other European states, have said that. Uh, as long as you're uh, fleeing from a war, it's okay, but not if you want to enhance your chances in life. Yeah, well, yes. So, so suffering is a standard for help, which, which I think is the wrong standard. I don't think that's a standard by which you should decide whether to help or not, or whether to pe bring people in. But I think it's deeper than that, and I'm, I'm going to say some controversial things that are going to upset people, but tough. Um, <laughs> You're just telling your point of view. Yeah, it says my point of view. Yeah, it's only my point of view. Yeah. I happen yeah. to think yeah. it's the yes. truth. Yes. I happen to think it's a truth, but your you truth. don't have to agree with no, me. No, no, your truth. My, yes. No, I think there is a truth. But again, you don't have to agree with me. You can you can say I'm full of shit. That's fine. But it's my point of view. Yeah, your point um, of view. Let me put this back to the other I think the deeper problem in Europe and in the West generally, is the issue of multiculturalism. It's the idea that all cultures are equal in some way. And I think this is a deep, deep problem in Europe, and I think a deep, deep problem everywhere. I don't think it's true. Cultures are not equal. And European culture has forgotten or repressed what made it great. I believe that the culture developed in Europe in, in, during the Enlightenment is the greatest culture in human history. And I think every culture in the world should emulate it. So the problems in the Middle East, in my view, would be solved if people were free. If people had respect for two concepts that come from Greece originally, but were developed during the Enlightenment in Europe. And those two concepts are reason, as a means of knowing reality, a, a dedication to reason that went through that period and it's reflected in the founding of America. And because of a dedication to reason, individualism. Individualism comes out of our dedication for reason. Because who reasons? Only individuals reason. So if you combine reason and individualism, 
They are what make a great culture. And they are what we should be exporting to the world. It's the idea that we should be encouraging every people in the world to embrace. And if you embrace reason and individualism, many of the problems all over the world, South America, Asia, and indeed the countries that have embraced it have done well. And the countries that have not embraced it haven't done well. So to the extent that Asian countries, Japan, to some extent China, certainly South Korea and Taiwan and Hong Kong and Singapore have embraced the ideas of reason and individualism, some explicitly, some implicitly, they've done phenomenally well. To the extent that they have, that other countries have not, they've done very, very poorly. But we in Europe, instead of saying, this is what we stand for, this is what it means to be European, if you will. These are the concepts that we stand behind. This is what, if you want to come here, this is what you should embrace. Just like in America, the idea was, if you come to America, it used to be, if you come to America, you should embrace the idea of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, what they represent. We don't do that in America today, and you don't do it in Europe anymore. And I think that's a disaster. I buy that, but I was also, uh, my thing was also more that uh, uh, if you focus too much on uh, equality, if, uh, uh, if uh, you, you don't give the people the opportunity yeah, to rise up who want if, to rise if, up. If, uh, if, the, uh, if the people coming here don't have the same uh, the same level uh, level of income or yeah. then then you will enhance inequality here. But if you look at uh, the people coming, uh, say people from Somalia or Afghanistan, where there's not really a war, but conditions are harsh. Yeah. Uh, then, uh, then uh, that would increase inequality here, but uh, uh, but uh, uh, you would get another view of the refugee. But this focus on uh, equality uh, basically uh, says that we only allow refugees. Certain types from. of refugees. I think you're right. I think you're right. Uh, can I give some examples of these countries that have actually done well in this regard? Sure. I mean, uh, uh, Japan is an obvious example. Japan, I don't know if you know, uh, after, when Japan was occupied in the Second World War, uh, MacArthur asked the Japanese uh, to write a constitution. So they wrote a constitution, and he read it, and he said, this is terrible. <laughs> and he shredded it. And MacArthur and his assistant... Right? General McCarthy, just some guy who was an assistant, wrote the Japanese Constitution. <laughs> and it is the only Constitution in the world that has the phrase that every individual has an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which obviously they took from the Declaration of Independence. And it's in the Japanese Constitution to this day. Now, Japan has done phenomenally well with that Constitution that they didn't want, that was crammed down their throat, but they wouldn't repeal it today because they've done phenomenally well with it. It's allowed them to stay free. For the longest period in Japanese history, they've allowed the economy to grow dramatically, standard of living to increase. It, you know, their military, they're not a military power anymore, which, you know, might change in the future, but, but at least today, they've done phenomenally well. Um, if, you look at, if you look at South Korea, South Korea used to be a dictatorship. When they abandoned dictatorship and started respecting individual lives, when they became free, they're rich today. They're one of the richest countries in the world, by far. And they're free. Right? Freedom of speech, all the freedoms that we take for granted, they have now. They never had it throughout the history of South Korea. There's never, I mean, look at North Korea. You've got the contrast of the, of the, the ethnic group, as if that matters, right? South Korea is thrived, and North Korea is a dying. Why? Because one adopted freedom and one didn't. Or, or you can go on and on. Hong Kong, no natural resources. A rock in the middle of nowhere. It was a fishing village 75 years ago. Today, GDP per capita is the same as the United States. People took rafts to get there. Why? No safety net, no, no protection. They weren't looking, it, it goes to your point, they weren't looking for refugees of this or that. Anybody could come, right? And most of the people who came, came there because they wanted to make a better life. And they worked hard, and today, relative to anybody else in Asia, or for that matter, most of the world, they're rich. On a per capita, GDP per capita basis, they're richer than Swedes. Uh, Korea is a really good example, actually. Yeah, because so you can see it right there. You can see the contrast. Uh, a more practical aspect. He wants me to stop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the past 90 minutes. I think it's time. Um, thank you very much for coming in. My pleasure. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's uh, been great. It's a great source of inspiration. Good. And, uh,
actually strange to me that not more people agree with what you say. <laughs> <laughs> strange to me too. <laughs> exactly. Of course, we got you some gifts. Wonderful. This is tea and candles and stuff all. A postcard uh, showing the gift from you. And of course, the uh, classic student beverage, uh, Arab Punch. <laughs> <laughs>